All right, everybody. So today we have back on the podcast, John Meadows. How you doing, man? Good, good. How are you, Ben? Been good, man. I think it's been, well, I was going to say a couple months, but it's got to be longer than that. Um, yeah, I mean, with COVID and everything, my, everything's a blur. But it uh, looks like we both just finished training legs today. So what did you do? I did, um, I'm actually getting ready to post it. I did leg curls with um, some heavy negatives mm-hmm. and I did leg presses with a slow tempo. Then I did uh, pendulum squat with two second holds at the bottom. Then I did split squats on the Smith machine. And did I miss anything? I think that's all I did today. Gotcha. Yeah, I, um, I, I've been doing some of the bigger exercises later in the workout, kind of like take the ego out of it and whatnot. And so I was doing, I did like a rest pause, leg curl, rest pause, leg extension. Um, I will give my man card up and say I did some rest pause, hip adduction and abduction. And uh, I actually, I feel like those, I don't know, like, I don't hate them. You know, I know people do hate on them, but like, I feel like they, there's some utility. I know actually Dante Trudell, um, he, he actually uses them as well at times. And then after that, I did a uh, one-legged leg press and I went as well with a very slow tempo, no lockout. And I set up my camera to record it. And just to kind of give an example of like what, you know, like the two failure set on like a hard leg exercise looks like. And of course, like I had it against the uh, like seated cab machine. And as I started, somebody got on the machine and the camera got knocked over. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. It you caught, just got to like, do it again. Uh, yeah. Next week I'll, I'll have to do it again. So hey, I've always said that the biggest driver for volume is Instagram because if people don't film it right, they got to do another set. <laughs> That's hilarious. So uh, I guess the last time we spoke was probably about like a couple weeks before your heart attack. Um, cause I, I oh, remember, okay. um, we actually, cause I made a video on it. And I know I sent you, you know, some like the, the comments I sent you that people were saying about you, like the nice comments and wishing you well, that was maybe like a third of the comments I saw. And I'm sure you, obviously you got tons and tons from other people. So you're, you're certainly well loved in the industry, but, um, we, I remember we actually talked about your heart health, just kind of generally speaking, and then, yeah. and then obviously everything happened. So, I mean, I think most people know you had a heart attack and, and when was that roughly? May 11th. May 11th. Okay. So, wow. We were actually closer to the year then. Um, and it seemed like from what I've seen, you're feeling pretty good, right? I mean, you've been, I don't know if you've had too many symptoms. Uh, the last, I remember seeing an update from you, which was maybe a few months back, you, there was some part of your heart that seemed to have, you know, that has not come back and your ejection fraction was about 35%. Is that still roughly where you're at? Yeah, I actually had an appointment yesterday okay. and um, I haven't even talked about it with anybody at all until now, actually. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> there's this thing, let me look it up. So I got it right here on the screenshot. It's, um, I've actually never heard this term before and I was visiting Dr. Serrano. It's called the point of maximal impulse, PMI, point of maximal impulse. And so that's when their doctors are looking at your heart, they can feel the point of maximal impulse, just like it sounds. And it's usually at a location on your heart. And usually it's down around the apex of your left ventricle. Um, So when I had the heart attack, my LAD, my left anterior descending artery was fully blocked and it caused damage to that part of my heart. Um, which is why my ejection fraction was so low. And so anyways, when I saw uh, Dr. Serrano yesterday, he, um, he kind of smiled at me and he said, and he described to me the point of maximum impulse was over on the right side where my right ventricle was, which you would expect because it has to work harder with the left ventricle not doing anything. Right. And then he said, you know, a few months back, he noticed it kind of moving. And then yesterday he said it was right over the apex of left ventricle. He said, so that part of your heart is now working. It may not be at hundred percent, but that tissue is actually working and contracting or else you couldn't feel that in that spot. Okay. So that's very positive news. Um, I haven't had any symptoms for probably, I don't know, six months at least. Yeah. Um, probably more than that actually. Um, but I've been feeling great. And um, so certainly yesterday, 
you know, I mean, it would be nice to have a cardiac MRI and things like that to, to really understand the tissue a little better. But yeah. that was certainly a good a positive sign, though. That's awesome, man. That, that's good to hear. So um, wait, was your ejection fraction measured by an echocardiogram or they did an MRI? Or might be both? I've done both. Yeah. And they were yeah, pretty similar. I've done both. Um, the, the, the cardiac MRI, they say, is a little bit more accurate. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, they, I know the, com the computations are a little more complex, whereas yeah. the echo, it's more open to interpretation. Right. But um, it was <clears throat> act right after the heart attack, everything was below 30%. And oh, really? um, no. so my last checkup, which was in December, it was up 34%. He said he expected this was my cardiologist. And he, he said he expected it to keep climbing and keep going up. Good. Um, so. And you're still, um, I know um, some of the Medicaid, obviously you're probably taking like ubiquinol or CoQ10. Um, I remember one Yeah, I megadose, I megadose ubiquinol. I take 600 milligrams a day. Wow. Um, there's no downside to it. So yeah. Um, and I take three grams of carnitine a day. Okay. Um, what else do I take? I take D-ribose. So yeah. Uh, take 10 grams of that. What else do I take? Um, I think that's it. I mean, I obviously I take the baby aspirin and other things like of that nature. But, but yeah. for my actual heart injection fraction, I think uh, ubiquinol um, or CoQ10, if you can't get a good ubiquinol formula, that and a high dose of L-carnitine and D-ribose are probably about as good as a combination as you're going to get supplement-wise. Yeah. Yeah. And just for people who, you know, ubiquinol and um, CoQ10, you know, it's just one's a reduced form, one's not. And so they they will say, or at least I've read people say, well, when you're younger, you can take CoQ10. When you're older, you need uh, ubiquinol. But actually, even when I was, I want to say like 26, I took a similar dose of each. Like I did, I think was it was like eight weeks of one, washout period and then eight weeks of the other and my coq10 blood levels were still even at 26 three times higher with ubiquinol so i just take ubiquinol um, and that's usually what i recommend like you said there's not a, really much of a downside or any downside other than it's it's, it's i would say it's a super expensive supplement but it's not like a really cheap supplement either um 600 milligrams a day is probably you know yeah. <laughs> it gets expensive um yeah. but it, it, i think it's one of the few supplements that has some robust evidence for it you know, oh, there's tons of evidence for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I was, I don't want to focus on this the whole time, but I'm just curious medication wise, are you on a beta blocker or an ARB or anything like that? Yeah. I still take the Carvedilol, um, okay. the beta blocker. I still take a blood thinner, which I'll probably have to take for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, just due to my history. Right. And, um, and, uh, I take lisinopril too. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, one thing people might not know, and because obviously people say, well, is it from the lifestyle and, and the bodybuilding and everything that goes along with that? But you also, I, I believe both of your parents had heart attacks at young ages. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, my, my uh, biological mother, I believe, had a heart attack in her 30s. Wow. And um, she, she died at an early age, um, but you know, she also had a lot of problems. She was a drug addict and alcoholic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, okay. that could have been a part of it too. My dad, who I never met, um, I was always told he had a pacemaker when he was in his forties and he died at a young age too. So okay. that's what I was told. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was trying to understand my family history, that's, right. that's what I was told. Right. Yeah. And obviously a lot of this stuff, it comes down to, you know, genetics and environment, right. It's, it's very hard to rule out, you know, maybe in certain, maybe a, a perfect lifestyle would have avoided it, but obviously some people are just more predisposed to it. I mean, I, I know you're on, um, someone like the bodybuilding forums and you see that stuff all the time where, uh, you know, maybe somebody didn't know they had a clotting condition or something. And, and then um, maybe something in the bodybuilding lifestyle makes that show up. Right. And it's very hard to distinguish it, but yeah, uh, yep. I'm, I'm sure everybody's very glad to hear you're, you're doing well. It sounds like you're still training very intensely. Right. I mean, and I've seen I train very videos. hard. Yeah. I train and, very hard. And I guess yeah. obviously your doctors have signed off on that being not an issue. No, I mean, a strong heart um, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I do my cardio too. You know, obviously there's obviously there's two different sets of adaptations from weight training and cardio, which yeah. are both good for your heart. Um, so yeah, no, he, he wants me to train hard. And um, so I do. It's really hard to even get me out of breath though. I mean, really? I feel like I'm in pretty good shape. That's good. That's awesome. Man. Yeah, I had a, I like immediately changed the cardiologist because they were like, well, I just don't think anybody should lift heavy. And I was like, what do you mean? Like with a heart condition? Like, no, just anybody, like not more than like a hundred pounds. And I was like, 
what? Like, <laughs> like based on what? Like, there, you know, almost every yeah, study. That's pretty silly. Yeah, it was really silly. Like, I immediately, I immediately switched doctors. But um, it, almost every study shows, even with relatively intense weight training, that there's benefits to the heart. I, I mean, if you're like, you know, actually like severe heart failure, yeah, there's going to be some contraindications. But for yeah, most yeah. people, it, you know, it, most almost every study is in favor of it. So. Yeah, I mean, they're a little worried about the Valsalva maneuver and all right. that stuff. But generally speaking, that's pretty that's pretty bad advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I know you're, you're a big Marvel fan. And I've been, you know, I've, I'm a huge Marvel fan. And we haven't had a movie in, I don't know, like a year and a half, two years. How are you feeling about it? <laughs> there was, you know, there were two movies I really wanted to see. I wanted to see Black Widow. Yeah. And on a non-Marvel related note, I wanted to see A Quiet Place 2. Yeah, that never came out. I was out. I intrigued by like Quiet Place. Yeah. I thought that was a great movie. They were both supposed to come out last year in May. Yeah. Um, of course, that's when everything was shut down. Right. And they were both supposed to come out in May. And now, like, I think the Black Widow one, I think they're going to release it, I don't know, May or June, I'm hearing. Really? In theaters or? I, I think it might be going straight to maybe the Disney Channel or something uh, where they Disney have all Plus. the. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not really sure, but those were the two movies I really wanted to see, and they yeah. were back to back. I was all excited, and then obviously they got taken. It, did, it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, Quiet Place was good. I mean, I think that's basically like a prequel. Is the Quiet Place two? Yeah. And then, um, I mean, I like all Marvel movies, so I'd certainly see Black Widow. They did release straight to, I guess, HBO Max or something. Um, Wonder Woman through, for DC. Which I didn't like, watch it. Like yeah. my buddies all said it's the worst thing they ever watched. So I, I haven't even actually seen it. <laughs> it wasn't horrible, but it wasn't as good as the first. And it, you know, it's just different. Like the theater is a whole, at least for me, you know, going to the, the theater and seeing the Marvel movies was always an experience. So yeah. That, yeah. that's kind of a bummer. I mean, a lot of these theaters, I don't even know if they're coming back. I know some of them talked about just staying shut down. So yeah. it's a shame. So I actually, I, I think you saw, I put on uh, my Instagram story that like, you know, send uh, questions for John. And I have a lot already that I want to talk to you about, but I was, I got so many DMs, so I, I figure, you know, if you have the time, we'll, we'll get through some of those. Um, and, you know, somebody, Brian Bornstein, Borstein, I, I got a good, no N, um, he submitted a question that about something you do that sounded very similar to Scott Stevenson's Muscle Rounds. And he was hoping that you could elaborate on it because I, I wasn't actually aware that you did this. And it was something along the lines, I guess it's an intensity technique maybe that you do, that you do it, you use a 12 rep max, and, and then you extend the set. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because I, I- Yeah, there's a couple things there that I can speak on, yeah. Okay, yeah, if you could delve into that. Because um, I'm familiar with Scott's method uh, pretty well, but I, I'm not sure how you do it, that's different. Well, there's a couple things I do. There's, there's one, which is just a simple cluster set, um, which is, you know, let's say you have a weight you can do for 10. Um, you'll do maybe eight with it. You gotta leave a couple reps or then the cluster set, does, it, you'll just die. You can't yeah. do any reps. Right. Um, so say you do eight with it, you rest 20 seconds, then you come pretty close to failure, you rest 20 seconds, and then you go to failure. So um, I'm a big, big believer in quality reps, which means hard reps. And I don't understand why that's even debatable that hard reps are the ones that matter. I don't yeah. even understand how that's even a discussion, but whatever. <laughs> so if you think about doing like, let's say you do three sets of 10, and let's say the last three sets or reps are hard on each set, you've got nine hard reps. Look at a cluster set. Let's say you do 10, um, you know, you only do eight, 10 is your max, you only do eight, maybe only get one hard rep out of that, but then the next, say you get eight, the next, maybe four of those are hard. And then you do another cluster and maybe you get another five or six, you do, so you got another six reps or something like that, just ballpark. You'll always end up with a lot more hard reps right? Um, when you do it that way. And um it's a good way to have hard reps. And I'm a big believer in safely doing hard reps. And the other thing that you might be talking about is um, um, I have this thing where I do, I call it the rule of 25 and it's something really dumb. I just made up, but it, <laughs> but it takes that cluster set theory, even the next step higher. So you pick a weight out, you, you go, you work up to a hard set of 10, something, I'm just using 10 as an example, sure. but that's generally what we do. It could be eight, it could be 10, but it's right in a ballpark. So let's your 10th rep, you can barely get it with good form. And the key to this is it has to be full range of motion, good form. 
when you can no longer do full range of motion, you stop. That's the, that's the most reps you get with full range of motion. So what I do is then I do a second set where I say, okay, do 25 reps with that, with what you can barely get for 10. So you would do say 10, mm-hmm. let's say you're on a leg extension. Then you get out of the machine, you just shake your legs, you get back in, you do another say four or five, you get out of the machine, you get back in, you shake your legs, maybe do three and you keep going all the way up to 25. Now in your head, how many hard reps that was? That's going to be a lot of hard reps. It's going to be better than three sets of 10. It's even harder than a cluster set. So that's even another way. Um, Obviously, you got to be careful with exercise selection. You wouldn't want to do that on a barbell squat. Right. But if you're using a machine that's very safe, it's it's a great way to get a lot of really hard reps. The only thing you got to be careful of is it's brutal and it'll make you really sore if you overdo it. So if you're going to do something like that during your workout, you only want to do maybe one set. Or maybe you do it on two exercises and do two sets. Any more than that would be straight overkill. Well, you know, and you say you got to choose the right exercise, which I agree with. When I was first getting into lifting, so maybe like 2005 or six, um, you know, I was coming up in a time where like breathing squats were the big thing and, you know, the widow makers, right? So basically select a 10 to 12 rep max to failure hold it, take a few breaths and eventually get to 20, which was like, you know, just mind bogglingly difficult. Um, and yeah. I think I will always remember the hardest leg workouts I did where like I would do it on Saturdays. And by like Wednesday, I was like fearing Saturdays and it was two sets of breathing squats to start. And then it was super steady. And this was like one of those routines where it's like, why, why did I do this? You know, I was 14 and like, but um, supersetting leg extensions with leg press, like one back to the back, and then hack squat with straight legged deadlifts. By the time I was, you know, straight legged deadlifts, I was bending over wanting to just puke. And I, I, yeah. I remember a trainer coming up to me asking if I was okay, because I would just lie on the ground. So uh, while I don't have great legs, I, I at least know that I've done a lot <laughs> to try to get them. You know, I yeah, you did that at 14 years old? Yeah, man, I was get up at 5 a.m. and go to the gym with my dad because obviously I didn't have a license. So I was kind of a nut in high school with what I attempted. That's impressive. That's impressive. I respect that. (laughs) Um, So but, you know, you mentioned like the hard reps and it's interesting because like I actually do a lot of rest pause now. And I used like for us, I used to do maybe three sets. And it's interesting, this whole um, effective reps concept. And is it just the last, you know, five or whatever? Pick your number that's actually hard. And, you know, I'm not going to pretend like I know every mechanism about it. I understand that some people will say even like the lighter reps help with volume. Um, And I've also now having been lifting for like 17 years, I also realized that I could do something that's less effective and still maintain because we know that the stimulus to maintain doesn't have to be as great. But with that said, right. right. But with that said, I have dropped a lot of these, you know, three sets of something to an all out set rest 40 seconds, you know, kind of like a DC rest pause and it's faster for sure. And I I certainly haven't lost any size, you know, whether it's the best, I'm not sure. Um, But to your point now, I like the number of hard reps is probably almost identical. And I've seen people talk about that. And and one of the questions that was submitted for you was, you know, what do you think about this whole debate now with like RIR leaving X number of reps in the tank? And I mean, there are some people who argue never even get within like, you know, more than like two, two reps in the tank. And um, one of the questions was like, you know, what do you think is more effective two sets at a two RIR versus one set to all out fa- uh, failure. And I think, you know, in the evidence-based crowd or maybe like, like Mike Israel might say, Oh, absolutely. You know, the higher volume, not going to failure, but I feel like maybe like you or Scott Stevenson or Dante would say like, you need to push hard. You can't, ha- you can't grow optimally without some sets to failure. So what do you think? Well, there's a lot to um, unpack there. So yeah. first of all, what the industry has done a terrible job of is when they make these recommendations, they don't specify who it's for. And the way that I'm talking, like the uh, cluster technique, the, the widow makers, all that stuff, those are for advanced trainees. Like right. you're not going to bring in a, a beginner into the gym and have them do that, or even an intermediate. So most of the things I talk about is for people who are very advanced. Now, I think we're, um, and I'm friends with all these guys, you have in a space crowd, as you know. I think where we lose complete common sense 
is thinking that doing, let's say you do that three sets of 10 per volume or four sets of 10 or whatever it is. If you really truly think those first seven or eight reps are going to do anything, I think you're going to be sadly disappointed as an advanced trainee. As a beginner, the extra volume, yes, for sure. As an intermediate, yes, will probably help. But when you get advanced, there's a lot of things happening. So you're getting better mind-muscle connection. Your sets are more efficient. Um, you don't need all that volume. Um, and I just think that, okay, let's say, let's say you can squat 400. And let's say you can do it for, let's say you can do 315. I'm just going to make this up. Let's say you can do it for 10 reps. And every week you just do seven. That's cool. I'm going to leave a lot of reps in the tank. I'm just going to do seven. I'm not really going to challenge myself. I want you to explain to me how that's going to create an adaptation to make you bigger, or stronger. It's not, it's just not. Um, and I think the guys that have been training 20, 30 years who've really been in the trenches will say there has to be points where you have high intensity. Now you also have to use common sense. You can't just go in the gym and do, I'm going to do drop sets. Then I'm going to do a cluster set. Then I'm going to do, I mean, of course you can go overboard. Um, every awesome bodybuilder I know, every awesome athlete, all have found, they have pushed herself to um, really high levels of performance, really, really push themselves hard. And it absolutely makes me just want to cry when I hear people <laughs> saying, you don't have to go that hard. Yeah. If you're a beginner, if you're intermediate, that's fine. But if you really want to see, if you really want to maximize your genetic potential, there's got to be periods where you just really go hard. Now, here's the other thing. Um, okay, I believe in evidence. I agree. I, I, I believe in progressive overload. I think we would all agree that's effective, right? Progressive overload. I want you to explain to me how you can use progressive overload, but always leave reps in the tank. Mm -hmm. Explain that to me. Right. There is no explanation because if you're really truly doing progressive overload, you're going to go a little heavier, a little heavier, a little heavier. And eventually you won't have an RPE of three reps left in the tank. Right. Reps in reserve with three reps left in the tank. You just go harder. You just make it more challenging. Um, so, you know, you get all these, you know, young folks that watch some YouTube videos and they're like, oh, he's training way too hard. I'm like, you, if you've never even pushed yourself, I think everybody that trains should at some point get into a state where they're probably a little overtrained just so yeah. they know what they're capable of. Now, some people, it may be eight sets and maybe four of them are hard. Some people, it may be 12 sets and, you know, some, some people, maybe 16 sets. But if you've never even had the guts to push yourself to even find out what you're capable of, you never want to reach your genetic potential. You can read all the articles you want. You can listen to all the experts you want, but you will not reach your genetic potential. I 100% promise you that. Yeah. I mean, I have to agree because I mean, like you said, and the thing is, I'm not trying to create a straw man argument with these people. I realize like even those who say keep reps in reserve will at times have periods where they go into failure. But I think, I mean, I've heard people argue that in theory, and again, it's clearly in theory because nobody would actually do this. They'll say in theory, there's no reason why you couldn't grow just as much if you just, you know, manipulated volume, but always kept, let's say two to three reps in reserve. And like you, I just, I just don't believe it. And like you said, how would that even look? Like how would you eventually, there's probably going to be some progression where you're like, well, I've been trying to beat last week or last month, right. you know, right. which is inherently going to happen. So we're never, right. we're never going to it see. It makes no sense. Yeah. We're just, we're not going to see that, you know? It's like, so. wait a minute, you believe in progressive overload, but you always leave reps on the tank. Explain to me how that works. That means, that means you have to start at such a low point yeah. to progressive overload to, to, you have to start like way below what your capabilities are. And, um, you know, I have trained with pretty much every philosophy you can basically think of. Yeah, right. <laughs> and um, I do think that also you have to look at kind of the mental makeup of people. And some people just aren't mentally made up to push yourself that hard. Yeah. So you're probably going to need to get more effective reps by adding more sets. So that person who mm -hmm. can't really go that hard, they just don't have the mental strength to do it. Instead of doing, you know, something, one of these really hard things, maybe they are going to have to do four sets of 10 because they're going to have to get a couple extra sets to get those effective reps in. Right. 
Um, so I do recognize that not everybody has the mental capability of pushing herself to the level I'm talking about because, yeah. you know, I, it's a, it's fair. It's fair. Some people just don't. Um, yeah. And then also like, I mean, there are times when I'm going really hard and then I was like, okay, I feel it's, it's time to pull back now. Maybe my, maybe my joints don't feel as good. Maybe my, you know, peak powers off. I can tell like things are going the wrong way. Then, Hey, let's back off the intensity. Let's leave a lot of reps in the tank nothing to failure and it's kind of this individual individualistic periodization you know strength sports have a lot of really good research on how to periodize how to peak and things like that bodybuilding there is no such plan um period periodizing for bodybuilding is very different because um it, let's say you're doing awesome you know your weight's going up you're getting bigger you're getting stronger you feel like a million bucks oh well this piece of paper says i should deload for two weeks now why Right. You're doing great. Why? Why would you stop? Just because a piece of paper and somebody wrote a book and says, now you got to periodize. This isn't strength sports. This is bodybuilding. When you see, you know, indicators that it might be time to pull back, then pull back. Listen to your body. Now, some people don't, they don't really understand how to listen to their body. It's a whole nother discussion. But if you're really in tune with your body, there'll be times where you'll know, okay, I need to pull back. You know, like when I have people in town, like, uh, you know, like when Terrence and Sean Clarita were in town, we trained really hard. Mm -hmm. You better believe when they left, the next time I went to the gym, I chilled for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, man, you know, trying to keep up with these young bucks is really yeah. hard on an old guy. <laughs> so, but I think just in general, the way you train, there's got to be flexibility. You can't say, well, we do this all the time. Like there's going to be different phases you go through. What I like to see in general is people really find out how hard they can push their self. And then listen to your body, then you might have to back off. It goes like this. It goes in waves. You can't just do this. Right. Um, well, I so think I noticed that. These are just that. some kind of off the top or just some thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I noticed. See, I, I trained alone for like most of my life. And when I went to college, I remember like, you know, I was always brought up of like, you know, you don't wear sleeveless shirts. Like I was like, oh, you're like too much of a bro. Like I just like kept it myself and it was like kind of like that mentality. And then I met my friends and, you know, started wearing the cutoffs and everything too. But like, <laughs> you know, I, I realized that how I train is not how most people train. And I didn't, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to read the right material really early. So I was training legs at least as much and as hard as upper body and things like that. But um, I, I saw this with my, like you were talking about some people just don't have the capacity to train as hard. And part of that's a time thing, right? I mean, most beginners aren't going to train as much as hard as like maybe 10 years in. Yeah. Um, but I, yep. right, right. You don't need to as well. And so like my, my cousin visited recently and I made a post on Instagram about it and this kid, so his mom is like my non-blood relative and their side just has these crazy legs. So at 17 years old, barely trains at all has like his legs, like dwarf mine. I mean, just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's really ridiculous. And, um, you know, I've done these crazy things, like just almost like you said, almost just to push myself, not because I thought it would be a long-term effective thing, but like I remember doing, again, I don't have the strongest legs, but I remember doing 225 for 15 front squats, followed by 135 for 50 front squats and just like wanting to like die after that. But like, there was just something about, like I just wanted to see how much I could rep it out, you know, and just for me. And I had him come and work out with me because he had been wanting to. And he, we put 315 on the bar for a deadlift and he's literally never done this ever. 315 just goes up and I'm like, are you kidding me with this kid? We put 365 on and he goes and he's just like, oh no, I can't do it. And I'm like, I know, like I seen how quickly 315 went up. I was like, I know you could do this for reps, but he just, you know, he's like, doesn't have that in him yet at least, you know, but there's definitely a mentality you see. And, and I, one thing I've brought up to other people is like, I, I sometimes I wonder if like a sports background helps there. Like I was always athletic and, and this kid doesn't really play any sports. And maybe learning that competitive drive really early on gets people to like learn how to push themselves versus if you were just kind of, I don't know, non-athletic, maybe it takes a longer period of time. That's a great point. And um, just the competitive nature in general. Um, I was, when I was training and then the craziest stuff I've, I've done, I always left the gym with kind of, um, there were two, there were really three kind of feelings I had. One feeling was I was um, I was a little proud of myself, like because I don't think there's too many people in the world that could push yourself this hard. 
in particular when I was like training with Dave Tate or, you know, guys like that, like we were doing stuff that, you know, most of these guys now couldn't even dream of doing. Um, and the other thing was, was I felt like um, <laughs> it's almost like a spiritual enlightenment. It's like, I didn't know I was capable of doing that, but there's something inside of me, some passion that allows me to do that. There's a mm -hmm. passion that I, I don't know if people are born with it or they can learn it. I, I just don't know. I had it at a really young age. That's why I was so impressed by you doing that stuff at 14 years mm -hmm. old, because I was training at 12 years old myself. And I felt it even then. I felt it when I looked at Muscle and Fitness Magazine. And I said, I want to be a pro bodybuilder when I was 12 years old. And I felt the passion then. And I never let up. Like, I never said, well, I'm just going to chill for three years. This isn't for me. I, right. I felt that passion. And that's a rare thing. Yeah. Um, so you got to, you know, having that passion, like you, you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm putting it into motion. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm executing it. Um, you know, you feel like you're kind of doing some stuff, you know, other people aren't doing. And, right. um, and the other thing was, was just competitiveness, like not even with myself, like, you know, Dave and I would try to kill each other. Right. Like, like, I'm going to do something so insane. He's not gonna be able to do it. And then he would do something. And I'd be like, man, God, how'd he do that? And, you know, when I trained with Scott Stevenson, Scott's like that. We try to, you know, that's, and I think that's a good thing as long as yeah. you don't do something so stupid, you get injured. But um, I love training with partners because I love that aspect of it. And what I think, and I, I've always believed in leading by example. Um, and I always think to myself, I'm going to set the bar high. I'm going to push myself so that they know what I expect. Right. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of things that go into training really hard that, that go beyond science. It goes to, you know, this passion that you have and really fueling it and a competitive nature, a competitive spirit, you know, it's kind of, um, I, don't know, I guess kind of boring when, when I see somebody that just looks at everything without passion. It's just, yeah. you know, I hear him say, well, you know, just to approach it with no emotion. It's just numbers. It's just this and that. I mean, I'm not saying that doesn't work. That's cool. You do, you, you do your thing, but I like to feel emotion. I like to feel passion. I like to go after it. I like to get after it. Yeah. I like to walk out of the gym and feel something like I did something. So I know that's not everybody's cup of tea. It just happens to be how I'm made. Yeah, no, that's great, man. How, how is Dave, by the way? I haven't seen much from him in recent years. He's doing awesome. Uh, between you and I, we're working on a training program together right now. We're about nice. two thirds of the way through it. So awesome. it's going to be, in my opinion, the best power building program that's been out in a long time okay that's so, awesome man yeah so um, we'll see more to come i haven't i haven't really told anybody yet but you okay. and, and your listeners now know that i was gonna say when you see it between me and you do you mean me and you and the audience or <laughs> me you and the audience okay great yeah. um you know you actually made a, a comment you said oh you know as you get more advanced like you don't need that volume because you have these more effective sets and things and and i've heard um what's his name jeff alberts from 3dmj mentioned something similar and I, I kind of prescribed to something similar, which is interesting because again, going back to like the evidence-based crowd, a lot of people say you need more volume as you get bigger. But I think a lot of people like you and others say, well, you're way stronger and you know how to perform the sets more. So you don't need as much volume. Um, and actually Alberto Nunez submitted a question saying, could you go into your volume metrics? And, and I'm guessing maybe he means like how you measure volume um, maybe how you regulate that, because I, I, I know you do some higher volume stuff, at least, uh, historically, if I recall, but I know you've, you've done pretty much everything. Um, but maybe you, you could just kind of delve into the volume metrics you use now versus maybe when you were younger. Um, yeah, sure. Well, first of all, Alberto is an awesome dude. I love him. Um, I think that when I think about volume, so first of all, let me tell you this. I, I feel like with the volume conversation, Okay, let me just say this. So let's say you take Dorian Yates and he does four sets and he works up to a hard set of rows. And Dorian says, that's how we're set. I just did one set. Now you see Joe Blow do four sets. He works up to a hard set. And he does a hard set. And he said, well, you know, I did 135, then I did 225, then I did 315, then I did 405. So I did four sets. Okay, the reality is they both just did the same thing. But you got one guy saying he did four, four sets and one guy saying he did one set. So first of all, the whole volume discussion can be absolutely stupid. 
I just what may on that, but go ahead and I'll, I'll I mean, on. yeah, I mean, so that's one of the things I see. And like, I know people who trained with Mike Minster and said, Mike did the same thing you and I do. He worked his way up. He did a hard set, but he did a lot of sets to get up to that. He just didn't count those sets where he was trained with guys like Arnold or other guys that did the exact same thing, but they counted their sets. Yeah. But one's low volume, one's high volume, but they're doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, the way I look at volume is I look at the quality sets. I look at the real sets. Because, again, you cannot convince me that a guy doing a set of six or seven when he could have done 10 or 12 is really going to create the adaptations. I mean, you've got to create – you've got to put enough stress on your body to create an adaptation. So what are the sets that actually do that? That's the true volume for me. Now, if you leave two reps in the tank, is that a real set? Yeah, that's legit. That's legit. If you leave one set in the tank or one rep in the tank, yeah, that's a legit set. Um, so once you get to that where you're, you know, down to two or three reps is all you got. And you get, like, those are real sets to me. Yeah. So, you know, I usually think of it like for me personally, if I'm on an exercise, there's going to be a set near the end that's probably effective. And then the last set is certainly going to be effective. So if I'm doing, say, I'm just making this up, say I do yeah. four exercises, then there's probably what I call eight hard sets. Someone who walked into the gym might say I did 16 sets, so because they didn't see the lead-in sets. Right. Um, one thing that I think I've gotten better at through the years that I was really dumb in my youth was, let me give you a leg press example. The way I used to do leg presses, and it's actually wrote up like this in some of my older programs, one plate for 10, two plates for 10, three plates for 10, all the way up to nine plates for like 10, mm -hmm. and that's your hard set. Well, what did the five for 10, six for 10, and seven for 10 really do for you? All I did was fatigue you. All I did was tire you out. They served no purpose. So the way I would do that now is I would do maybe one plate for 15 to get some blood in there, two plates for 15. Then I might only do sets of three, three yeah. for three, just to feel, I call those feeder sets, just to get you, because you don't want to go from three plates straight to 10, right? That's just dumb. You'll get injured. So you got to have a safe way to get to your hard set. So, you know, then I bring the reps way down just to feel the weight. You know, like when I do the pendulum squat, I'll give you an example today. I just do the machine for like three slow reps and then I'll do one plate for like three slow reps and then I'll use my working weight. Maybe I'll do two plates that way and then I'll go to three. Um, but my point is, is I'm trying to conserve more energy so I can really try to maximize the last set I do and even really the last two sets. Mm -hmm. um, I think forgetting about the volume and having two real high quality sets like that on each exercise is probably a good way to go for most people. Um, and then I think it's more tailoring your exercises. Okay, do I do three exercises? Do I do four? Then you got to kind of figure out what you can recover from. Can I recover from four exercises? No, well, then I probably should try three. But what I would say is for somebody that's advanced like Alberto, he's going to need those two hard sets, particularly the last one. He's going to yeah. need that. He's been training a long time. His body's been put through a lot of adaptation. So is Alberto doing 10 sets of 10 going to do a lot for him if he's leaving four or five reps in the tank every set? It's just going to fatigue him. But if he gets to that last set, now he really goes all in and he really pushes himself. He gives himself, um, you know, the other thing to look at too is, I know I'm kind of getting off topic here, yeah. but, you know, we talk about being evidence-based. So let's talk about what actually causes muscle growth, right? It's mechanical tension. Um, it's activation, and I would add in it's, come, it's getting some fatigue in the muscle fibers. If, if fatigue didn't matter, then all the powerlifters that are doing sets of two or three would be huge. But how many guys you see now that are 165 pounds that are deadlifting six, 700 pounds, and they don't even look like they lift weights? Yeah. So it's a different type of training. So, you know, if the weight is enough to create mechanical tension, and activation, you know, if you're 85% or 87%, you're probably getting pretty daggone close to full activation. Then if you're getting close to failure, real good chance you're getting full activation. So you got that, you got enough mechanical tension. And then if you're coming close to failure, you're fatiguing muscle fibers. What else can you do? Right. Like, what else can you do? Like, you've done what the muscle requires for growth. I mean, provided you're eating and you're sleeping and all that. Sure. But from a training point perspective, and this is why I tell people that, Log books are both good and bad. They're good in theory because you can track and you can really see progress. So they're excellent. But when someone takes a log book and they say, I didn't beat what I did last week. So this week, this workout was a failure. 
No, it wasn't. What does it take to grow muscle? It takes activation. It takes mechanical tension and some level of fatigue. Did you do that? Well, yes, I did. Then it wasn't a failure. I would take 20 years of that over, you know, someone doing a PR, 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 then boom, they tear a muscle. Like right. it's the consistency over the long period of time. And as long as you, and this is why um, I think intensity is really when you get to the advanced level, it's really what matters. It's that's what's going to spur the growth and create adaptations. It's not just adding a set, another set where you just kind of go through the motions just to say you added a set. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would echo all of that. Um, it's funny because so I, I trained pretty much how you mentioned, you know, my warm up sets initially, higher reps, just getting it going. And then I go lower in reps because I don't really want to fatigue. Like if I'm doing 100 pound dumbbells for 10, I personally don't want to do 90s for 10 right before that because it's going to be more fatiguing. But were you ever on the T Nation forums? A little bit. I mean, obviously, I used to have a contract with those guys for probably uh, yeah, four or yeah. five years, but a little bit. So I don't know if you remember this guy, Professor X, but he uh, he actually met up with Christian T. Yeah, yeah, the big brother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he had this really popular threat. And I, I mean, I literally just last week released a video on this, and it was called like ramping sets. And there was an article as well called like, you know, all bodybuilders do one set, which is, you know, a little bit of um, an exaggeration. But basically this what in my video, I said, look, if you look at there was a the very classic video of Ronnie Coleman doing chest and triceps. <clears throat> and he says, uh, you know, somebody might look at this and say, oh, he's doing, I don't know, 15 sets. But what is he doing? He's using 200 pound dumbbells for 12 reps. So he goes with the 100 pound dumbbells for 12. And then he does the 150s for maybe eight or 10. And then he does the 200s for 12, right? And then he does a similar thing for incline and then a similar thing for flies. Well, he really did three or four work sets, right? Yes. But people would say, oh, he does like in a, in a magazine, 12 sets for chest, right? And like you said, it, it's just, how are you counting it? But, how are you, for, counting? you know, all these bodybuilders, I don't, don't want to say they all do the same thing. Obviously there's variation, but like that is how a lot of them do it. They ramp up and then they do one or two all out sets. They're not doing five straight sets with the same weight. I mean, that's very uncommon from what I've seen yep. in professional bodybuilders. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I think it was, I think it's maybe was more common in the eighties and nineties, mm -hmm. you know, because the muscle and fitness magazines would say four sets of 10 here, four sets of 10 here, three sets right. of 12 there and three sets of 10 there. So people would say, okay, well, I'm going to work up to something I can do for around 10. I'm just going to stay there. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, I think that people have gotten a little bit wiser about training now and trying to get more out of those really hard sets. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so just this is one's a total change in topic, but just regarding the the fitness industry, somebody asked, do you think uh, Greg Doucette has been more of a, a positive or negative for the industry? I, I assume you're familiar with Greg Doucette. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure he's helped some people. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's not necessarily my style, but I'm sure he's helped some people. So you know, hey, that's pretty much all I have to say. <laughs> okay, I, I think that, that gives us an idea. Cool. Um, let me see. Oh, so, so actually, this is one that I brought up to Scott Stevenson. And do you know Cornelius Parkin? I do know that name. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we actually might train together soon, which would be cool. But he what I, I was mentioning to him and Scott was, you know, this is something I've heard echoed by others is, you know, you have like natural trainees and coaches and then enhanced. And obviously I think natural coaches tend to focus on natural trainees almost always, but I would say enhanced coaches tend to do both. And do you think like one thing I'm glad to see is that people don't just write off somebody because they're in an untested organization or something like that. Right. I think obviously like, I don't want to say specific names, but like there's brilliant enhanced coaches right who have a ton to um to teach but do you think that after so many years of no longer being natural and maybe not dealing with the plateaus that a natural has to deal with you almost uh, an enhanced coach could start to maybe forget what that's like because and not to say that they just always increase the dose but just that when you have something that's such a powerful stimulus maybe you just kind of lose touch with what it was like to not have that. 
Oh, I think that's very legitimate. Absolutely. And, um, you know, this is why I have so much respect for guys like Alberto, the coach and natural guys, because you actually have to think through issues and solve them. You can't just throw extra anadrol and thyroid at people. You right. know, you actually have to try to solve problems. So I have tremendous respect for people who coach natural athletes um, because the situation is different. You know, you're, you don't have ramped up protein synthesis 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, I mean, there's a, your recovery is not on another level. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that um, it is, that's a very valid concern. And, you know, I work with both sides of the coin year round. So, you know, I see it year round. People assume that I'm just only working with some of the top pros, but I'm like, no, it's probably, it's probably half and half. Like mm-hmm. half of my people don't even compete and they're just people trying to get in better shape. And then half are really, really good pros. Yeah. And the approaches while similar can also be very different. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's, yeah, those are good thoughts. Yeah. Um, I, I guess just to briefly expand, I mean, do, well, I guess we know the answer to this, but do you, do you think it's changed in the industry in the last five years or so where, cause I mean, I've heard, I'm sure you've heard more than I have, but like some of these un- really unfortunate stories where somebody goes into a coaching situation and they're just thrown these like, um, you know, super supplements that they don't know anything about. I've actually really heard some unfortunate stories with women, with female coaches or female clients. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the first thing that came to my head when you said that. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's frustrating as somebody who's like not really in that world as much, but who hears these stories where it's like, how could you have done this? But I think a lot of people just don't know, like having been in this field for, I don't know, 17 years now and you even longer, at least I sometimes forget that there is still a lot of naivety out there and that a lot of people coming in this, they've been in it for six months. They have no idea how harmful some of the things could be. I mean, I guess that's, it's kind of like an open-ended topic, but just if, like thoughts on that. And I don't know if there's any, other than education, is there anything really to do about it? Well, so a couple things. I'm a, I'm a big believer in, um, in um, it's a free country, do what you want. But I also am a big believer in if you're a coach, um, you should you should really try to help particularly women understand what they're doing instead of just throwing stuff at them because a lot of times they don't know. I just started um, coaching three high level pros um, last month. I just had them in my roster, and all three of them had horror stories from what they had been told to do. And I'm listening like what they were told to do, and I'm just like, oh my god, like wow. Um, and actually, I got an email today from another go- girl who's a really high level pro. And she was like, this is what my coach was having me do. And it was trend and all kinds of stuff, trend and test. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Wow. Um, yeah, it is sad. And the coaches will move on. I have a really good friend who was really, really good in figure. And um, um, I, let's just say a coach really, really hung her out to dry. And um, then he moved on and doesn't talk to her. It's like it's real easy to pump them full of drugs and then you move on. And then they, the women have to deal with the side effects because they're permanent. Yeah. And then the guy goes on. He's still I'm super coach and whatever. But there's a trail of bodies behind him that nobody knows about. So Ugh. it's um, it's it's yeah, it's frustrating when you hear stories like that. And it's real. Um, there's tons of stories out there like that. Yeah. And I think um, a, lot, a lot of times not to peg them into a hole. But I, I think a lot of times it can be really emotional. For, I mean, a, a competing is emotional for anybody, but I, I think like, you know, a woman's first or second competition and they have this authoritative coach and they trust them and, you know, they, they probably, you know, they think, oh, this person's going to be proud and whatever. And, and they really do anything to succeed. And then like, uh, it just made me like sad to even think of that. And then that person just kind of, well, coaching's up, good luck. Like, and now they're just stuck. And of course, and then the rebound after that, that they have to deal with psychologically. I mean, yeah. that's, that's really unfortunate. But. It's tough. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the last question I have for you is, you know, you've been, so how long have you actually been lifting? So I'm going to be 49 next month. And I started when I was 12. I'm not very good oh. with math. So you okay. have to do the math there. Yeah. It's, yeah. Wow. So 37 years. So, um, <laughs> so you've, you know, done a lot right? I think probably a huge emotional point for you was, you know, gleaning the pro card. I, I know that was something that took a long time for you. And I, I think 
the industry as a whole was happy that you finally got that. Um, and then obviously in recent years or in the last year, you know, you, you've had some lower points and um, just generally, do you, do you have anything big that you would change or that you regret that maybe if somebody is coming up as the next passionate 12 year old or whatever, like, you know, that you would say, Hey, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done this or I should, you know, should have done this. Well, I've done a lot of dumb stuff. So I'm, um, I'm an experimenter by nature. Mm -hmm. So if you look at like the evidence-based crowd that says, I'm only going to do stuff when there's evidence for it, I'm the complete opposite. I want to try everything. Yeah. And then I want to take the stuff that doesn't work and throw it out. And I want to take the stuff that does work and I want to adapt it. I want to be ahead of the curve rather than someone who's just sitting around browsing PubMed, waiting on someone to give them permission to do something. Right. So I've done a lot of dumb stuff. And, um, you know, but I mean, if, but if you look at the result of it, so like training wise, I have trained too much, too many sets, too hard. I have went through many phases like that in my career. But you know what it did? It told me what my limit was. It, had I never done that, I wouldn't know what I'm capable of. Um, so it served as a valuable learning tool, you know. And in terms of nutrition, you know, you got to remember growing up in the 80s and 90s, we were um, power shoving food. It didn't quality of calories didn't matter. It was just you need a 500 calorie surplus. No, you need to eat until you want to <laughs> puke. And so I remember, you know, I'm five, seven. I remember getting up to 260 pounds. And, um, and I remember by the time I did all the cardio and the low calories that I needed to do because I got so fat that I had lost muscle. And eventually I got to the point where I would start my diets at like 227 or 230 and look awesome at 222. Um, so I went through periods where I did stupid stuff eating wise. I ate everything. I just no, no thought about the quality of the food, no thoughts about digestion. I'm just going to eat everything. I went through periods where I trained like a maniac. I did stupid stuff. So I pretty much made a lot of the mistakes that, you know, you could make. Yeah. Um, but they kind of served a purpose. I think if I was, I think if I was going to tell people nowadays, it'd be more in relation to um, two things. So number one is you've got to look at your relationships that you have in your life and you can't say, you can't get so self-absorbed that you just forget everybody else and then you just focus on yourself. Oh, bodybuilding is a selfish sport, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it is. But why do you have to alienate everybody around you? Why do you cut yourself off from friendships, from it could be romantic relationships, it could be friendships you have with people. But I've seen through the years so many people lose their families, get divorced, um, have not see their kids because they're so absorbed with bodybuilding that nothing else outside of that realm matters to them and it destroys lives. Um, so I would tell people that you've got to, listen, you're only going to train so many hours a day and you're going to eat so many meals. So what are you doing the rest of your day? Right. Man, nurture your friendships, nurture your relationships. That's what's going to make you really happy. Like winning the trophy is cool. But having an awesome family and awesome friends and great relationships, that's really cool. That's way better than a trophy. And, you know, I've kind of learned that the hard way. You know, I was in my 20s, man. The only thing that mattered to me is bodybuilding. That was it. That was all that mattered to me. And luckily, I had awesome friends that would, you know, hang with me despite that attitude. And luckily, they're still friends of mine. But I had what I would call a very selfish attitude. And, um that would be my, that would be number one. Um, if I had to talk to a young guy, it's don't forget what's really important in life. Don't forget that. All right. The other thing is patience because everything you're hearing on social media now, it's these overnight sensations. I've seen a lot of overnight sensations come and go through the years. And I got a message today from a, a person and he was very frustrated that he'd been training with me for three weeks and he didn't look radically different. Wow. Three weeks, three weeks, 21 yeah. days. And um, like, oh. you, got, you guys got to learn patience, man. Like the worst thing you can say to me is this needs to happen in one year. Like you're talking to the wrong guy. Right, right. <laughs> so, 
Um, the other thing, that's my dog making weird noises. He's he's uh, he's asleep. He's dreaming. He, he oh, really? What do you have? What um, kind of dog? Let me see if I can. Okay. See him back there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cute. It's American Bully. He's a puppy. Um, so, but he's barking in his food. That's funny. So, um, you know, maintain your relationships. Be patient. You've got to put in the work. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. I know a lot of people say that, but you really got to take that to heart because bodybuilding is something too, where you never really hit perfection. So you're always like, what can I do better? What can Mm -hmm. I do better? I'm constantly studying what Brad Schoenfeld's doing. I'm constantly reading what Chris Beardsley's saying. I'm still trying to enhance what I know. Um, I'm a football coach now. I spend, look, here's an example, drawing up plays. Nice. From yesterday. Like I'm constantly trying to get better and better at everything I do. And I think there's a lot of people in the industry that will never think about the gurus in our industry who will never give credit to anybody else for anything. They're so afraid of not being the ultimate source of knowledge that they'll right. never acknowledge they try anything else. I'm the complete opposite. I listen to what everybody says. I listen to what Mike says, Israel Taylor. I listen to what Brad Schoenfeld says. I listen to what all these guys say, I listen to what Greg Doucette says. I listen to what everybody says because I want to like, am I missing something? Is there yeah. something again? I'm the ultimate experimenter. I experiment with everything because I think there's a lot of people out there that know stuff that I don't know. Um, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Like I can, we get on a call. You, we, you and I can get on a call with Scott Stevenson and you'll figure out very quickly. Scott's <laughs> intelligence is a level above mine, if not 10 levels above mine. <laughs> Scott's a smart guy. And one of the things that was liberating for me was probably like 10 years ago, I went from this phase where I really wanted to be the smartest guy in the industry to where I didn't care anymore. Mm. I just didn't care. I just said, you know what? I don't care. I just want to be a good person and I want to be good at what I do, but I want to, I just want to keep learning. And that's my attitude. I'm not the smartest guy. Mike, Brad, Chris, all those guys are smarter than me. All of them are. The advantage I have is I've just trained for so long. I've made a lot of dumb mistakes and I've, yeah. I've seen, I've done a lot. But um, so the other thing I would add, I guess that's the third one, is just stay humble, keep learning, seek out knowledge. Um, so, you know, take care of your, your relationships, be patient and continue to learn. Like those are, the, if you do those three things, I think you're going to be pretty happy. Yeah, well, you know, and you made the point about what else are you doing with your time? And it's it's interesting because when I was younger and when you compare it to amateur sports, I do think bodybuilding is definitely more intensive. I mean, it, it can take up everything, right? I mean, obviously, especially if you're competing, but I mean, just like the lifting game, like it's the sleep, it's all the nutrition, you know, compared to if you're playing like a high school sport, maybe it's just those two hours of practice and whatever. However, I, I will say that when you can get really damn far still having a normal life. Whereas like with some sports that you just can't, like at the extreme levels, it's, it's what you do and that's your life, but you can be a pretty damn good bodybuilder and still get normal amounts of sleep and have a family and have relationships and a job, you know? And, um, I mean, I think you're a good example of that. Like, yeah, right. And, and, And so, um, I certainly understand the desire. I mean, I gave up a lot in high school to try to make the best progress. And really it was probably to my detriment. Um, like even results wise, it might've been to my detriment because I was stressed about it and everything. But, um, that, that was one of my regrets. And that's, that's one of the things I try to talk about on the channel is like, don't do that. Like, I'm glad I learned it in high school. And so I still got to have a lot of fun in college and and on from there. But, um, you know, I gave up a lot really unnecessarily. And and I think you can still have a a totally normal life and still make a lot of progress in there, you know, for sure. For sure. That's, that's un, that, for sure. Yeah. The only other thing I wanted to comment on real quick was, and one of the reasons I love talking to you and some of these, like, I wouldn't say old school guys, but guys who've been around for like a long time, you said you're always trying to learn from people. And I just, you know, I remember that passion in up until maybe even like a few years ago, but like you'd come across like a new store. I'm, I'm sure maybe you had this with magazines and maybe even still now, but like you come across something new and you, you get that kind of feeling of like, Oh, like this is something here, you know, and you just spend hours just reading it and you're like, you're so excited to do it. And, you know, if I'm honest, I don't have that as much anymore, but that was a really great. And so talking back to like the people who are younger, that was a really great period, you know, where it was just, it was so exciting and every new routine, you're like, this is it, you know, and, and just, it's a cool period. So just try to 
enjoy that period because that doesn't last forever, you know? It's so. phenomenal. Yeah. And there's so much information out there. Like it's all at your fingertips. Yeah, yep. for sure. All right, all right, man, John. Well, I always appreciate talking to you. Always a good chat. And uh, I think a lot of people know you at this point, but where can people find more of your stuff? Um, well, my YouTube and my Instagram is Melton Dog One, and my website is MeltonDogDiet.com. Awesome. Thanks again, John. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on.